Good evening. How's Life Point Church doing tonight? Man, isn't this awesome to see everybody in, in, in this building tonight? It's just awesome to see it filled up. I want to welcome you guys. I want to welcome everybody online. If you would, just stand with us, and we're going to sing a song tonight that talks about the cross of Christ.
mistake about it. We're here to celebrate what he accomplished on that cross. So tonight we are going to read through the events leading up and to the cross. We're going to read, our staff is going to come and read that tonight. Uh, But before we do, let's open in prayer and let's invite the presence of the Lord here, both here in this room and and those that are online tonight. I pray that God would would visit you uh, as he visits us tonight. Let's, Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, the name that's above every other name, the name that was given to your son and put in a position of great authority because of his sacrifice. So Lord, tonight we're asking that you would help us to not just to remember the cross, not just remember how cruel it was, but Lord, help us to remember what difference it makes in our lives today. Lord, help us to begin to fathom the depth of your love that would, uh, that would cause Jesus to go through what he went through. Lord, I pray that we would sense and know once again how deep your love is for us by reading and by taking in once again the steps that led up to the cross in our Savior's life. Lord, speak to us. Help us today, God, as we remember this moment that forever changed history and has forever changed our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. You may be seated tonight. Just want you to follow along on the screens as we read this powerful story. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and he found them asleep. He said to Peter, could you not watch with me even for one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away, Unless I drink it, your will be done. And when he returned to them again, he found them asleep, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same thing again. Then he came to the disciples, and he said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor Judas had given them all a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed and gave him the kiss. Jesus said, my friend... Go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us? And and he would send them instantly? But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that described what must happen now? Then Jesus said to the crowd, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. 
Then the people who had arrested Jesus led him to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of religious law and elders had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter had followed him at a distance and came to the high priest's courtyard. He went in and sat with the guards and waited to see how it all would end. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. But even though they found many who would agreed to give false witness, they could not use anyone's testimony. And finally, two men came forward who declared, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, well, aren't you going to answer for these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replied, you have said it. And in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, blasphemy. Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty. They shouted, he deserves to die. Then they began to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fists. And some slapped him, jeering, prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who hit you that time? Very early in the morning, the leading priest and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Then they bound him, led him away, took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews, the governor asked him. Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they are bringing against you, Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now it was the, the governor's custom each year during Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year, there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release, Barabbas or Jesus, who you call the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for that Jesus be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release? The crowd shouted, Barabbas! Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him! Why? Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him! Pilate saw that he was, wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and he washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a, a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head, and they placed a wreath stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon, who is from Cyrene. And the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. 
And they went out to a place called Golgotha, which means this. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. So he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now, and we will believe in him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs were opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this truly was the Son of God. What a dark day that was, literally, what a dark day that was, as we just read that it was dark, and in the midst of that darkness, Christ lay hanging, or lay dying on a cross. I don't know if there's any, ever a darker moment in, in the history of the world you can imagine what the people there were experiencing because it was unlike any other crucifixion. This crucifixion affected everything. The weather, it affected people. It actually talk about, talks about an earthquake that happened. And the brutality of going to a Roman's cross cannot be overstated. And although it's important to to relive somehow what Christ went through for us because in so doing, we actually begin to understand the depths of his love for us. To know that he would go through all of that, both for his father and for us. And if you can imagine going through that for a people, the very people who were, was torturing, who were torturing you and crucifying you, but I believe, as, as important as that is, if tonight and many traditions on a Good Friday service would leave it right there, because there is something about allowing that to settle into our hearts once again some 2,000 years later. We live so far from the cross, so far from uh, that culture, that context. But I believe if we ended there, if Jesus were standing here and as we were walking out, I believe he would call us back in and say, you've missed the point. You've missed the point. As important as it is to understand the sacrifice, I believe Jesus would want us to know not just what happened to him, but what he accomplished on the cross. What took place on the cross. You see, Good Friday is good not because of what Jesus went through, but because of what he accomplished. Good Friday is all about the power of the cross. It is all about the power of the cross. And we get a glimpse of the power of the cross in that last reading, if you caught it, in Matthew 27, verse 50, when Jesus shouted his last and gave up his spirit, which means he died, and he said those, these words, 
as, as he shouted out, it says that the moment the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You see, we get a glimpse of the power of the cross. And, and if you can put yourself there, it's completely dark when all this is happening. But in the midst of that darkness, something catastrophic happens in the temple. There is a four-inch tapestry curtain that is torn not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. This is the curtain. The referring to that curtain is the curtain that separates God's presence from the rest of the temple. It's where the Holy of Holies, where the, the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And that place was only visited once a year. And then only by one person, one man, the high priest. So in essence, there's only, there could only be one person who could go into the presence of God and then only once a year. That is the tapestry. That is the curtain that was torn from top to bottom. The holy of holies where God's presence had, dwell, had dwelt in. So what could have caused that type of power? What could have caused that four inch thick tapestry to be torn from top to bottom? Why did it happen at the very point that Jesus died? What did it mean? And that, my friends, is what begins to make Good Friday good. Because what happened to Jesus wasn't good. Nothing about that was good for him. You see, the first point of Good Friday is this, that the power of the cross is that it took away everything that separates us from God. The first point of Good Friday is that the power of the cross took away everything that separates us from God. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, it says this, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now, would you say but now? <laughs> but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of the power of the cross. You see, sin, as we know, separates us from God. The power of the cross paid the penalty for our sins. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, it, it says that he was delivered over to death for one reason, for our sins. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. So you see, everything about going to the cross was all about getting rid of our debt of sin, the, the debt that we owe to society, if you will, in heaven. Jesus paid for that. That was some of the power that tore that veil, that, that curtain in half. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 23, it says, He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. In other words, Jesus used the cross to make the payment for our sin, for our debt of sin. That's what is beginning to make Good Friday so good. That is a part of the power of the cross as we see Jesus hanging on it. The veil in the temple was torn in two because God ripped it himself. God tore it open because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. No longer would sin keep us separated from God. No longer would there be just be one person who could go in and be in God's presence. No longer... Was it just selective? Now it was open. And this all happened under the cover of darkness. You see, so many people, including Satan himself, thought it was finished. Darkness had covered the land, and it was going to cover it spiritually from now on. But in the midst of all the darkness, in the midst of all the suffering, the pain, and the chaos, and the hopelessness of that moment, God was doing something much bigger. 
You see, the other point of the, of, the, of the power of the cross is this, is that it broke the power of sin over our lives. At the same time that Jesus paid the penalty, paid our debt off of sin that separated us from God, it also severed this slavery that we have to sin, th this thing that causes us to do things that we don't want to do, no matter how hard we try, no matter how many things we put into place, it just seems to... To, to haunt us, to, to keep us down, to keep us chained. And, and the power of the cross is this. In Romans chapter 6, verse 6, it says, For we know that our old self was crucified. That's just another word, another phrase for our broken human nature, our sin nature, our old self. That, that's our broken human nature, that, that part of us that makes us self-centered and selfish and, and, um, and prideful. Everything about us that hurts us and those around us, it says, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin, that, that's what was happening in our life, might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. The power of the cross cannot be overlooked on Good Friday. Jesus went through a lot, but he wants us to know this tonight. He wants us to take in how much he loves us and what he went through in that moment. But he also wants us to understand what he accomplished in that moment. You see, sin separates us from God. That is the death that the Bible talks about. This body dying is one thing, but being separated from God is a, an eternal death, an eternal separation from him. I think all would agree that God is holy. That means he's perfect. And I think all would agree that we are anything but holy. Don't elbow your neighbor. It's not a good time. <laughs> that, that's what God is, isn't it? He's holy. He's perfect. I mean, ask anyone, those who believe in God and those who don't believe in God, uh, if they consider themselves to be holy. Virtually everybody would say, absolutely not. I'm not holy. To be holy would mean that we had never done anything wrong in our life, that we are not doing anything wrong, and we will never do anything wrong. That's what it means to be holy, what, what, what it means to be perfect. And so a perfect God loved us so much in our imperfection that he would do anything to make us perfect so that we could, would no longer be separated from him. That's what was taking place on the cross. That's why the veil, that's why that four-inch tapestry was torn in two because God himself ripped it apart, signifying that we had been made right. We, had been made, we have been made perfect as God is perfect, as Jesus is perfect. That's exactly what happened on the cross. When we accept Christ into our lives as our Savior and our Lord, our old self, our old broken human nature gets crucified with him. And the last point about the power of the cross tonight as we remember what Jesus went through, but also we celebrate what he accomplished, is that the power of the cross disarmed our greatest enemy. The power of the cross is not that it took Jesus' life, but the power of the cross is what it took away from the enemy. In Colossians chapter 2, it says, and I read this earlier, but verse 15, I want you, to, want you to focus on this part. He forgave all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You see, the devil is our greatest enemy. Regardless of what Hollywood portrays, the power of the supernatural that causes fear in us. We watch Hollywood portray the supernatural, the dark side of things, and somehow that educates us in this place of power and, and authority in the dark regions and and it instills a fear in us but at the cross at the cross jesus disarmed that authority 
We no longer have to fear that anymore. We no longer have to fear Satan because Satan is a defeated foe because of the cross. This is why Good Friday is so good. Jesus disarmed him so we no longer have to live in fear. I love what Matthew 28 says that Jesus is talking to his disciples as he is, after he is resurrected from the dead and, and Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, now therefore go. He's talking about disarming the authorities of the prince of darkness, the one that wants to see us killed. He wants to steal from us. He wants to destroy us. Because of what Jesus accomplished and sacrificed on the cross, God made his name greater than any name. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. You see, this is the power of the cross. Listen to this. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, would you say therefore? therefore. Because of that, God has given him the name, the highest place. God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, it was at the cross where God made the name of Jesus above all other names. And why did he do that? Because Jesus went to the cross and gave his life there. It says clear, plainly, that after Jesus did that, his name became greater. It's that authority. It's that he disarmed the enemy. And not only did he disarm the enemy, but he said, I, I, I've made the name of Jesus, that name, higher than any, anything else, any other name, in heaven, on the earth, and even under the earth. It talks about these realms, the spiritual realm in heaven, what we deal with on earth, and even the dark realm under the earth speaks of this dark place, this, this kingdom of darkness. It says Jesus' name is above all of that. It's highly exalted. It has authority over every place in our life. You see, the cross is powerful. Not because of, what it, not because of its punishment. It's powerful because of what Jesus used it for. It's powerful because of what God did through the life of Christ on that cross. So what are we to do as we survey this wondrous cross, as, as we talk about the blood of Jesus running down for our sins, making us white as snow? How do we live in light of that tonight? How do we go home tonight allowing this to sink in? And again, once again, to know his love for you and me because of what he went through. But, but even just as important, to know what he accomplished through it for our life, that we would no longer live condemned. We would no longer live under condemnation. And friends, you know as well as I do, as Christians, and even as those who might not even believe in God, we live lives at times very condemned, because we know we're not perfect. We know that we mess up. We know that when we look in the mirror, we know what's going on inside of our heads. We know what's hidden in our hearts where nobody else knows, and, and that is condemning us. And we are told that the power of the cross has made us perfect. What Jesus did has made us perfect. And somehow if we can live in that, not because of our goodness, not because of our ability to do everything right now, but because a perfect God took an imperfect people and made us perfect in his sight through the life of Christ. So what are we to do? Romans, Romans 10 says, if you've never accepted Christ, if you've never acknowledged him as your Savior and your Lord, it says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord. In other words, that you understand now because of the cross you see, there's, there's, not a, there, there's not a history, there, there's not a, there's not a, um, a historian, whether, whether it be secular or sacred, there's not a historian that, that, would, that would deny that Jesus lived. There was not, there's not a historian that would deny that he died on a cross. It is well documented throughout history, both biblically and extra-biblical. 
It, it, it's all over. There's not a historian that would deny that. And yet we as Christians, and even you, if you have not found that place to believe in Christ, but this Good Friday that talks about the power of the cross says that if you will declare him as Lord, if you will understand that what happened on the cross made his name above every other name, if you declare that Jesus is Lord of your life and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'd be saved. For it goes on to say, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. You don't have to worry about being ashamed of your decision. If you're in the throes of deciding what you're going to do with Jesus, just know this, you'll never regret it. You'll never be put to shame. Because he is on, he has removed it all from your life, and he will stand with you just like he stood in this moment. For all those of us that are believers, what do we do with Good Friday and the power of the cross? In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy, get this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us throw off everything that hinders us for we are no longer slaves to sin because of the cross. Amen. We are no longer carrying, we no longer have to carry the shame of our lives, both past and present, because Jesus endured that. He took our shame, nailing it to the cross. And tonight, I believe Jesus would say, live in the freedom that I've conquered for you on the cross. Live in it. Let this be a reminder to you. If you're like me, I've been a Christian since 1981. I know I don't look that old. I know, I know, I know. I dye my hair and beard white. It's just what I do. But I know this story. And the moment it becomes just a story is the moment that I lose track in my life as a Christian just what Jesus has done for me tonight I just want to encourage us both as Christians and those who are still figuring out and still wandering around in your faith with Jesus and God there is a freedom that God has for us and the cross declares it under the cover of darkness right now, we live in a time where we sense a lot of darkness. Make no mistake about it. God was at work in that darkness, and he's at work in this darkness. Amen. So tonight, we are here, and I am so grateful that you came tonight to honor his sacrifice and to celebrate his victory for us. Amen? Amen? Father, we love you tonight. Lord, as we declare this song, Lord, I pray that every, every condemning thought, every lie, every deception that the kingdom of darkness has invaded our soul with God, I pray that it would be broken and washed away in light of the cross, in light of what you did and are doing in our lives. Lord, we honor your sacrifice. We honor your suffering, but we celebrate your goodness. We celebrate your authority. We celebrate your power. We celebrate our freedom in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and let's declare this song tonight.
Strong. 
take a moment from your own heart and thank him. Because if you were the only one, he would have still went. We all know that. Oh God, we look to you tonight and we thank you. Because it all started with you, Father. Because it says when you sent your son, it was because of how much you loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his own and his son. It all started with your love for us, Father. You loved us so much that you became like one of us so that you could fulfill, so that you could pay the penalty of the law that you set. You came in our place. Thank you for your love tonight. Lord, I pray that there would be a fresh baptism in your love in our life, God. There is nothing more powerful than your love. There is not, And the cross, if it's anything, is the greatest demonstration of your love. Because you sent the greatest gift that you had, which was your son. So tonight, God, help us to walk more free than we ever have been because of your cross. Help us to see through all of the deceptions and lies. Help us to see through all the philosophies of mankind that would try to shroud you and, and discredit you tonight and help. May heaven open up tonight, God, over this place, over our community, over our country, God. And may your presence be known. May men and women, boys and girls, have a sense that they can come into your presence because of the love and the sacrifice of Jesus. Lord, I pray and we pray today that in this season, more people would find your presence. More people would be engulfed in your embrace, God. More people would find hope, God, than at any other time. We're asking in Jesus' name. Oh, God, and help us to know what it means to die to ourselves so that we can truly live. It's not a popular message, but God, that's where freedom really begins. If you're here tonight or you're online at home or wherever you're at watching this, or maybe you're here in this auditorium and you've never accepted Christ, or but tonight you know that something has changed, something's different in you. There is a... There's something going on in the depths of your soul, not just your emotions, but there is a, a, a leading, a drawing, a nudging to, to do something. And friends, tonight, that something is to lift your voice and to declare with your own mouth, Jesus, to be your Lord and Savior. To ask him to forgive you of the life that you've lived in sin to, to now declare that your life is his and in that moment knowing now that the sin that so easily is besetting you the, the sins that are keeping you chained in habits has now been severed and you and I no longer have to live in bondage any longer we have the ability to walk free in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for that tonight. And Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to speak to many hearts who right now are making that decision. Lord, we love you. and We seal this night. Lord, we leave this place both filled with encouragement, but also in awe of what you have went through for us, Jesus. And Lord, I pray you would bring us back this Sunday to celebrate, to celebrate that this is not where the story ends, that, that, there, is, that there is an exclamation point. If there, if there could be after the cross, God, the cross is so big and so powerful, but God, there's more. So I pray, God, that you would draw us back to a house of worship somewhere this Easter that we could gather together around this country and this world and declare that Jesus is Lord and King and Savior of the world. 
In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. can we give the Lord a round of applause? <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord. We celebrate you tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah, God. Well, tonight, that ends our service. But go tonight and allow yourself just to be so grateful as you've read and heard the story of Jesus' walk to the cross. But now you know the rest of the story, like Paul Harvey will. Tonight, you've heard the rest of the story again. Come back Sunday, and let's be ready to celebrate. Amen? God bless you. Have a great evening.